<laughs> and he also wrote down, he said, and I have found the least worst possible place to build. <laughs> and you're sitting on it right now. And I know it's hard to even picture at what time, but this was a beach. This was part of 1,500 acres of tide plus, just really soupy, swampy land. Mm -hmm. Surrounding the beach were hills and cliffs covered with trees. Arthur looks at the trees and says, okay, forget farming, we'll be a logging community. Folks, when you look out the window there, you're seeing a wall. On the other side of it today, that's First Avenue, but that was a waterfront. Okay, does anybody here think that this sounds like a good idea to build a town on a beach where it rains a lot? It's a bad idea, but to be fair to Arthur, folks, he was a farmer. He didn't know anything about building a city. And being from the Midwest, he knew nothing about tides. So it was a good thing when David Swinson Maynard in the corner here showed up from Cleveland, Ohio. He was a medical doctor back there. Now, Doc knew how to build a city because he had helped Cleveland grow from a town of 400 people to over 17,000. And the only reason he left Cleveland is because his marriage had fallen apart and there was a gold rush going on in California. And he said, that's going to be my fresh start. Grabbed his medical bag, hit the trail. And then to pay his way west, he was treating people along the Oregon Trail. In fact, how many of you here remember playing the Oregon Trail game on the computer? Okay, do you remember what you died of? Dysentery. Ooh, dysentery. <laughs> Starvation, drown. I mean, there's all kinds of things you could, you, could, you could die of out there, but the big killer, cholera. And most medical doctors, they wouldn't stop for cholera victims. Doc came across this group of people, they were all sick, but there was one, Catherine Brochiers. Catherine was beautiful. She was young, wealthy. For three days, he stayed by her side, and she pulled through. Unfortunately, couldn't save her husband. <laughs> I know, I know. Okay, so what happened to them? What happened next, folks? They did. They, they fell in love and they got married. Oh, wait, wait, wait. They didn't get married right away because, you know, Catherine had to mourn and move on. It was two weeks later at Trails End. So, <laughs> it turned out that Catherine's brother was living out here. So Doc gave up all of his plans in California. And when he and Catherine arrived and he looked at the trees, he saw dollar signs. Because Doc knew they could cut all that timber down that was up there on the hills. So we're cutting it down, loading it on ships out there in LA Bay, and it's going to California. Because not only were they having a gold rush, they were having a major problem with arson. And Doc thought, perfect. We got ourselves a steady market. But we also had a problem. Because these two men were complete opposites. They couldn't agree on anything. Denny here wants to build a town that's based off of his morals. So he said, I don't want any smoking here. There's going to be no swearing in my town and absolutely no alcohol. <laughs> and then he wants to base the economy off of bloggers, mill workers, and sailors. So <laughs> fortunately for those men, Doc right here loves to drink. Well, one day Doc was sitting in a saloon and he heard a man bragging about a steam-powered sawmill. Well, that's this guy over here on my right. His name is Henry Yesler and he's from Maslin, Ohio, but he's out here shopping his little steam-powered sawmill to, the, to all the towns in the Puget Sound area, and I think I used the word little. It wasn't little, because it was, if you had a steam-powered sawmill, you could cross the slumber three times faster. So Doc told him, you bring that mill to my town, and I'll give you my best piece of waterfront property. Do any of you know where the toy store is across the street on the corner, Metro's Toys? That's the corner that the sawmill went on. The only problem was whoever got the mill was now stuck with Henry Esler. Folks, the man was a piece of work. He had no morals, no ethical values whatsoever. So of course we made him our mayor. <laughs> then he did nothing but rip off this town left and right. But somehow through all the craziness, Seattle grew. But the problem was all of the growth happening is happening here on the beach. So they build the commercial district down here and then they start clearing timber off the hills. The hills became the residential district, but every day the tide would go up to what is now 2nd Avenue. And depending on the time of day, water would be ankle deep or it was knee deep. So imagine what the streets looked like here. Horses and wagons were always stuck in the mud. And once you pulled them out, we started having all these holes forming. Now today we would call them potholes. Back then they called them chuck holes. And at first the city said, well, we're not gonna fix the holes. Everybody just get used to them. When you come into town, just navigate around them, you'll be fine. Well, Henry Yesler said, no, 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 no. Here's how we'll fix them. Come over to my mill. 
on the back side of his mill, he had a mountain of sawdust, and he had to pay to get rid of all that stuff, and he didn't want to. So he convinced everyone in town to get buckets of sawdust and start packing them into the potholes. And they didn't stop there, because they continued spreading that sawdust all across the land here at the commercial district. And then they put buildings on sawdust mud flats. When you mix in sawdust with salt water and mud, the land around here, it was spongy. There was a visiting journalist who said, they don't have streets in Seattle. What they have are intersecting rivers of oatmeal. <laughs> if water isn't leaving town, folks, you have a bigger problem. Because guess what else wasn't leaving Seattle? Mm -hmm. Sewage. That's right, sewage. That was Seattle's number one problem. Or dare I say our number two problem, too. <laughs> I, there's a lot of sophisticated adult people on this tour. But, folks, sewage was a big problem because in those days, we didn't have modern day flush toilets yet. Everyone used an outhouse. And you folks all know what outhouses are, right? You dig a hole, you put a wooden shack on it. What happens when you dig a hole at the beach? <laughs> That's right. And after a while, all those deposits being made, they just started to float to the top. And then the tide came in, flushed all that sewage into the streets and sidewalks. So it's nasty and it's unsanitary, but help pay. Because in 1871, across the pond, there's a man who has just perfected the flushing mechanism on the modern day flush toilet. Do you folks know who that person is? It gets some credit. Yes, Crapper is a last name. Crapper is a last name. But what's Crapper's first name? What did you say? Somebody, I heard, I thought, okay, what is it? Oh my gosh, you student toilet history over here. <laughs> That's right, it's Thomas Crapper. Wait, do you know what his middle initial was or his middle name was? <laughs> no, was it Kohler? Um, it's Thomas A. Crapper. He was Queen Victoria's oh, and Sanitation Man. Yeah. Well, we ordered a thousand of those crapper devices. The order was misplaced. They didn't show up for 10 years. Uh -huh. And then the problem was when those things arrived, Seattle had forgotten they'd ever placed an order. <laughs> and they didn't have a sewer system. So they built one, fast and cheap, out of wood. It was one six by six inch box sewer pipe, and it was for 24,000 people. Here's how the pipe worked. One end of that pipe was up there on the hill where all the homes are, and then the other end of the pipe was in Elliott Bay. It worked on gravity, so everything up there shot off the hill, oozed, gurgled its way through the pipes, plopped out into the bay, and then the tide and the current took it 30 miles south to our rival city, Tacoma, Washington. <laughs> people in Seattle thought, perfect system. We got here, perfect system. But we all know tides come back. And eight hours later, Tacoma got its revenge. When that tide came in, sometimes it would come in so hard and so high, it covered up the outlet pipe, and now we had a closed system. You still had all that pressure that was coming down from the hills, and raw sewage and salt water was backing in the other end, and pressure would just build and build in that one little pipe. And if you were sitting on your crappers at the wrong time of the day, and then you reached up to pull that chain to flush, you'd better be a fast mover. Because if you didn't leap off, you were blown off. <laughs> Geysers of raw sewage and salt water would come blasting up at that crapper. And eyewitnesses said geysers were anywhere from four to six feet in height. And the city, the city refused to do anything about it. And this went on here, folks. Every single day for eight years, kids were being blown off their crappers. Well, then finally, you guys, finally Seattle got a break. And the break came in the form of the Great Seattle Fire. And after the fire, we rebuilt. And that's how we ended up in the underground. And that's what we're going to have the doors to see. Now, we're not going to come back to the room, so whatever you brought in, take it with you. If you